Hey guys, I'm very excited for another episode of Show About Science. This is your host, Nate. And today, we're going to interview Coyote Peterson. I've been waiting for this for so long, and now it's finally happening. Yay, this is going to be an awesome episode about animals. So stay tuned for a tarantula hawk. (laughs) Welcome, Coyote, to the show about science. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Nate. I'm excited to be talking to you right now. I know. I saw you on Ellen a couple days ago. I, I watched it. You did so awesome. I was blown away, and I love your bobblehead. Thanks. So, Coyote, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your YouTube channel? Sure. Uh, my name is Coyote Peterson, and I'm the host of the Animal Adventure Shows on the Brave Wilderness channel on YouTube. And my job consists of going out into the wild with my camera crew, where we get up close to some of the coolest and just most bizarre animals on the face of the planet. And the ultimate goal is that we can safely catch and present these animals so that everybody out there can watch and learn about these animals. And at the end of the day, we hope to promote conservation and a general awareness and love for the creatures that call our planet home. So, Coyote, the first creature I want to talk about today is the tarantula hawk, which makes my dad a little squeamish. So let's just start by playing a clip from one of your episodes. Bzzz. Now they say that the sting of the tarantula hawk is number two on the insect sting pain index. It's like being stunned with a taser, and they say it puts you into a state of paralysis for up to five minutes, where all you can do is scream. That's the tarantula hawk buzzing in the jar. I'm Coyote Peterson, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the tarantula hawk. Go for it. One, two, here we go, three. Okay, so question one. So why did you decide to um, get yourself stung by the tarantula hawk and the velvet ant and the bullet ant? Ooh, the famous question. Why do I get stung by these creepy crawlies? Well, the reason that I do it is so that we can all learn about the animals. Now, I could just catch one of these bugs and put it in a container and we could get cool shots of it and I could give you some facts and I could tell you that they have a very, very powerful sting that hurts really bad. But at the end of the day, you would probably say, well, how bad is it really? Does it really hurt that bad? And then people would write in and ask, well, why don't you get stung by it? Because that's what we'd really like to see. So we figured that if I'm getting stung by these animals, not only is it causing you to be interested in them and learn about them, but I'm also able to show you the effects of that venom on your body, ultimately resulting in you seeing how painful it is. And then hopefully if you're out there in the wild and you see some of these animals, you won't go try to pick them up or catch them yourselves. So what does it feel like to be stung by a bullet ant? Whoa, what it's like to be stung by a bullet ant. My goodness, it's something that you would never want to experience. It is like someone is heated up a poker in a fire and then stabbed it into your arm and then they hold it there. Uh, And then that burning doesn't go away. It lasts for about 24 hours and it's just one of the worst pains I've ever had to go through. So if you see a bullet ant in the wild, definitely just admire it from a safe distance. So I've got another question. All right. What does it feel like to be stung by a tarantula hawk because my auntie has some in her backyard. Oh, she does. Well, again, if you see one in her backyard, just admire it from a safe distance. Don't try to catch it. But actually, the initial sting from the tarantula hawk was more painful than the bullet ant. The only difference was the pain went away after five minutes. And it felt like somebody was shocking me with an electrical current, the sting of the, the tarantula hawk was. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah, and so why did you get yourself eaten alive by leeches? 
Oh, the leeches one. <laughs> well, actually, I've always kind of been a little bit afraid of leeches because whenever I go into swamps and ponds, like, you know, sometimes they'll be stuck on turtles and sometimes they'll get even stuck on me. And I try to pull them off really fast because I was afraid that they would, would suck blood. Then I did a little bit of research, and as it turns out, not all leeches actually consume human blood. In fact, most species of freshwater leeches that are here in the United States do not suck blood. So we did that test to prove that some leeches do and some leeches don't. And what was interesting about that is that when those leeches adhered to my arm, they have these little suction cup mouths and they actually secrete what's called an anticoagulant, which causes you to bleed more, and also a numbing agent, which causes you to not be able to feel the fact that they're biting you. So I didn't feel anything at all when they were drinking my blood. And then, of course, because of that anticoagulant, when I took the leeches off, that went into my arm and that's why I was bleeding so much after the fact. So tell us a little bit about your training and when you got into the enclosure with the wolverine oh yeah that was fun well the wolverine is actually one of my favorite animals when i was a little kid probably about your age i became very fascinated with wolverines and i would get books from the library and i would draw pictures and i would read everything that i could and I knew that there were none that lived where I grew up, which was in Ohio. And I always had this dream that one day I would actually get to meet a wolverine face to face. So my producing team did some research, and we found a guy named Steve Kroschel who lives in Alaska. And he has a wildlife sanctuary where he actually raises wolverines. And he's done this for 30 years. And we said, well, if there's anybody that could ever get me up close with a wolverine, it would be Steve. So when we showed up in Alaska, Steve thought we were just going to take pictures. He didn't even know that I wanted to, like, get into an enclosure with the wolverine. But we finally convinced him that, like, as long as he trained me to know some of the things that he did about interacting with the animal, how to connect with the planet, and then, of course, how to react in a situation if the wolverine gets a little rambunctious like it ultimately did, that I would be able to escape without getting clawed up or bitten. And, uh, yeah, for about two days we trained, and then he finally let me meet the wolverine, and he felt like the wolverine liked me, and he let me in the enclosure, and the rest of it was kind of history, and I got up close. So there's another video that you did from Steve Kroeschel's Wildlife Sanctuary. Let me play a clip from that episode. It's awesome and slobbery. So I've got these carrots and, if, and I'm going to open a door and then you just uh, offer her a carrot and then you should kiss her on the nose. This is very important. If she's not kissed, she'll feel like you don't like her, that she's not attractive, etc. You're asking me to kiss a moose? Yes. Kiss. See, now I'm talking to her. Now it's not exactly a juicer. You gotta go a little bit slower. Oh, I see that. Here, Let's... try it. Try one this way. She likes it. In the Don't let her pull your teeth out, though. Out of my mouth? Yeah, she'll pull your teeth out if you got it. That when she gets a little bit. Yeah. That's perfect. Do it again. That is nose to nose with Get the in moose. there. Get in there. Her neck is only so long. <laughs> oh, I got a moose slobber all That's over all right. It's all organic. You guys gotta try all this. Right. Can, the, can the crew try this? Uh, I don't know, but gotta get closer. <laughs> one more. There oh. So, why did you kiss a moose? Why did I kiss a moose? Well, that was another thing, like you know, that we did at Steve's Sanctuary. And on our last day of filming, he said, you know, we had filmed some stuff with the moose earlier on in our, our time there, just some B-roll shots, which I'm, I'm sure you know are just, you know, shots of the moose in its enclosure. And then Steve told us that Karen, Karen was the moose's name, that she was able to do this really cool trick that if you fed her carrots, she would kiss you. So he saved it for the last day, and the, and the last piece of content that we filmed was myself and Mark and Mario and Austin all getting to feed carrots to a moose and then getting to kiss the moose at the end. And I just did it because I thought it was going to be an interesting experience, but it was really slobbery and squishy. Okay, so I've got another question. I'm ready. So tell me a little bit about the episode about um, snapping turtle versus snapping turtle. Oh, the alligator snapping turtle versus the common snapping turtle? Right. That one? I was going to say the U.S. snapping turtle versus the European snapping turtle. Oh, gotcha. Well, we didn't do one that was a European snapping turtle. I think you're probably thinking of the alligator snapping turtle versus the common snapping turtle because those are the two very distinct kind of snapping turtles that are in the United States. Um, and I've always loved snapping turtles, and most people – 
just kind of look at a snapping turtle and think a snapping turtle is a snapping turtle, but there are two very distinct kinds, and we thought it was important to show the audience the distinct differences between the two. So we were in Louisiana filming episodes of Dragon Tales, and we intended to only catch alligator snapping turtles, but somehow, because I seem to catch common snapping turtles everywhere I go, managed to catch a snapping turtle as well. And we had also caught a smaller alligator snapping turtle that day that was about the same size. So, you know, just kind of on the spot, we thought to ourselves, well, let's do a comparison episode and show the audience these differences. And um, the episode did really well, and it actually inspired us to do a number of other comparison episodes, like centipede versus millipede or alligator versus crocodile. And uh, we're actually in the process of getting ready to make a sea star versus a brittle star episode. So um, tell us a little bit about fishing for octopus in the um, tides. Oh, the octopus is one of my favorites. And actually, here's something most people don't know. We tried to make that octopus episode several times before we actually caught one. Uh, that was our third time out to the tide pools. And every time we'd gone to the tide pools, you know, we got good episodes, but we were always constantly looking for the octopus. So then when we finally found one, it was so cool looking. It was like orange and brown and bluish in coloration. And it's cool because they can shift the chromatophores in their skin to help them change color and camouflage. And when we finally caught one and got it in the container, we were just so excited. And then, you know, being able to show that to the audience was definitely one of our big goals with Beyond the Tide. Because I think, in my opinion, it is the coolest tide pool creature that is out there. The coolest tide pool creature that is, aside from the black hair sea slug. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess you're right. The giant black sea hare is a pretty cool animal, too. And you want to know something? I didn't even know that those slugs were on the West Coast until we went out there. We were working with our marine specialist, Aaron Sanchez, and he said to us, you know, there's these giant black slugs out here. Would you guys have an interest in filming one of those? And we said, well, that sounds awesome because we had seen the smaller brown sea hares. Um, and it took us a while. And when we filmed that episode, it was actually Aaron that found the slug. And, you know, he called me over and then I picked it up. And um, he actually said that was one of the biggest sea slugs that he had ever seen, too. And he sees a lot of them. So it was pretty cool to get that guy on camera. Hey, could I uh, give an idea for an episode? Absolutely. I'm ready. Black sea slug versus brown sea hair. Ooh, that's a great idea. Yeah, you know what? I will actually let Mark and the other producers know about that, and don't be surprised if you see that one coming up in the near future. Okay, I won't. Awesome. So what can we do to um, help those animals? That's a great question. Well, I think in general to help any animal, one of the most important things you can do is actually learn about the animal because unfortunately a lot of people are afraid of some of the animals that are even right there in their own backyards like snakes and spiders. And the more that we know about animals, the more we can respect them and realize that they're such an important part of our planet. And then if you really want to get involved and go a step further beyond learning, you can always reach out to a local metro park or a wildlife sanctuary or a wildlife rehabilitation center and see how you can get involved right there in your community to help, you know, with anything they might need, whether it's helping clean animal cages or just, you know, helping promote their organization. Um, and all of those places are so important for the animals that are, are right there around you because it's these people running these sanctuaries that are helping these animals return to the wild if they're ever injured. So, between education and rehabilitation and just promotion of these places, I think those are some of the best things you can do to help all the animals that are out there. Thank you for being on the show, Coyote. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. And let me know if you ever want me to come back on again, and we'll hang out and talk podcasts and animals and bobbleheads. Okay, you're welcome. And, Dad, you can shut the recording off. <laughs>